The battle ended. The victor determined. Jesus fought a 40-day spiritual wrestling match with the devil in the Judean wilderness. The outcome of this duel authenticated the mission and ministry of Jesus as the Messiah. The temptation confirmed Jesus' sovereign rule over all aspects of the natural and spiritual realm of God. The temptation in the wilderness authenticated to the prince of this world, Satan, that Jesus had absolute kingship and authority over the kingdom of darkness. Luke recorded that Jesus returned from his desert temptation in the power of the Holy Spirit, while John emphasized that Jesus was given the Holy Spirit without measure. Luke emphasized that Jesus returned to Galilee upon leaving the desert, but a brief detour to the Jordan River was necessary. What would become of such an anointed holy prophet? When we harmonize the four Gospels, it is evident that Jesus returned to the Jordan River and John the Baptist. When John saw Jesus approaching, he stated in a loud voice, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. John's declaration indicated that Jesus was the prophetic fulfillment of the covenant of Abraham. Jesus was the final Passover Lamb to be slain. The Bible is unclear whether John realized that he prophesied the imminent death of Jesus and God's sacrifice for sin, but this declaration has Calvary hidden in its words. With the declaration of John, Jesus acquired his first disciples. Andrew and John heard the Baptist proclamation and they left John's ministry to submit to the ministry of Jesus. These two disciples approached Jesus and addressed him as rabbi. It's important to note that rabbi was a title of high respect given by the Jews to those who were prepared to interpret the law. The word rabbi is from the Hebrew word for lawgiver in Genesis 49.10. The following day, Andrew sought out his brother Simon Peter and reported that we have found the Messiah. From this declaration, it is evident that Andrew was the first disciple to recognize the messianic ministry of Jesus. Andrew based his faith on the testimony of the Baptist and the teachings of Jesus. Simon Peter responded to Andrew's invitation and came to Jesus. When Jesus saw Peter, he discerned his name and family by the power of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 1, verse 42. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Christ at this point prophesied the future revelation and position Peter would have in his church by changing Simon's name to Cephas, Aramaic for small stone, while Peter is the Greek equivalent. It is evident from Peter's actions that he did not understand Christ's evaluation of him. Peter's transformation would not occur until he experienced the revelation of Christ's Godhead and mission. Only then, did Simon's name actually change to Peter. It must be understood that Peter is not the Petra, the massive rock of Christian Ecclesia, but he is the Petros, a small stone, a piece of the rock that Jesus used to build his church. It would appear that Simon was affected by the encounter with Jesus, but he did not commit himself to Christ until he experienced the miracle of the two boats full of fish. Only after Peter submitted to the Lordship of Jesus was he called to be one of Christ's disciples. Andrew and John believed in the messianic ministry of Jesus because of his teachings, but Peter required a sign. 
even though the second disciple with Andrew is not mentioned. It is believed that this disciple was John, since he is the only disciple to mention this event in his gospel. The following day, Jesus left Judea to journey to Galilee to continue his ministry, where his fame went throughout the whole Galilean region. Why did Jesus make this journey so soon after his declaration by John? Should Jesus have remained in Judea after his identification by John, people might have thought his ministry to be an extension of John's ministry. In Galilee, the Lord appealed to the people based on his own person and message. The first person Jesus met in Galilee was Philip. He instructed Philip to follow him, and Philip immediately followed Jesus. Like Andrew before him, Philip reached out to bear witness to Christ's person to Nathanael. Philip witnessed that Christ was the prophet spoken by Moses, the Messiah. Deuteronomy 18.15 The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brethren. You must listen to him. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching him, he said, Here is a true Israelite, in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Jesus realized that Nathanael was a man who had no guile, no false front. Nathanael was not shrewd or skilled in the art of deception. He was a simple man of honesty and truth. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. The revelation of Christ's discernment led Nathanael to affirm his faith in the person of Christ, declaring him the Son of God and the King of Israel. In simple terms, Nathanael stated that Jesus was the fulfillment of the covenants God gave to Abraham and David. Nathanael understood that Jesus was the Messiah of prophecy, the King Priest of Zechariah. John chapter 1 verse 50 to 51. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. He then added, I tell you the truth, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus concluded his discourse with Nathanael with the promise that he should see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man in a fashion similar to Jacob and God's confirmation to him concerning the Abrahamic covenant. On the third day of Jesus' stay in Galilee, Jesus and his mother were invited to a wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. It was the custom of a Jewish wedding feast last between two and seven days, depending on the resources of the bridegroom. It was expected that guests would be provided with wine and delicacies to be enjoyed during the festivities. It's possible that Jesus created a problem at the feast due to the unexpected attendance of his disciples. The host of the wedding feast did not calculate for the extra guests. Mary, the mother of Jesus, confronted Jesus with this problem expecting him to exercise his messianic power and authority to create more wine. John chapter 2 verse 4 And Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Jesus rebuked his mother for thinking that messianic power would be used for selfish gain because this power can only be used to establish the kingdom. Jesus also rebuked his mother because the hour of his pouring out of the new wine to all humanity had not come. This statement of Jesus is a direct reference to Calvary and the establishment of the new covenant sealed with his blood. 
Should this be the case, then why did Jesus honor the request of his mother? Eventually, Christ honored the request of his mother and created approximately 120 gallons of new wine. The Bible indicates that this act was Christ's first miracle, and Jesus performed this miracle to manifest his messianic glory to his disciples and to confirm, settle, and strengthen their new faith. The Jewish nation constantly clamored for miracles, signs, and wonders to meet their desire for the unusual. Let's be careful. We don't judge them too harshly, because are we any different? What is our faith built on? Do we also look for the manifestation and the operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Do we build our faith on the person of Christ or on His works? Miracles are designed by God to confirm the ministers and the ministry of the Word of God. Signs and wonders are also designed to manifest the glory of God and establish our faith in Christ and confirm the King and build the Kingdom of God. At no time did God design the manifestation of the Holy Spirit to provide us with selfish gain. According to Acts chapter 1 verse 8, we are anointed to be witnesses of Christ to a hurting world. Miracles did more than authenticate the person and message of Jesus. They showed the spheres of authority Christ exercised. He displayed miracles over the physical realm by exercising control over nature, sickness and disease, even death. And Jesus manifested his authority over the spiritual realm by casting out demons. The kingdom of the Messiah will bind Satan and his influence. His kingly authority will rescue us from the kingdom of darkness and bring us into his own kingdom. A warning must be issued. In the last days, many false signs and wonders will cover the earth to deceive the nations into following false Christs. We can only be deceived to the degree we follow signs and not Christ. The love of the truth is our guard against deception. Recently, some secular fringe theorists have speculated that the wedding at Cana referenced in John chapter 2 was the secret marriage of Jesus to Mary Magdalene. The theory suggests that Mary, the mother of Jesus, telling the servants to follow Jesus' instructions reflected the role of the groom's mother, who according to Jewish tradition, was in charge of the servants. Could this theory be correct? Ben Witherington III, professor of New Testament theology at Asbury Theological Seminary, wrote an excellent response to this theory in the Biblical Archaeology Review, September 2006 edition entitled, Was the Wedding at Cana Jesus' Nuptials? He made the following observations concerning the Cana wedding theory. We must recognize, however, that it is entirely an argument from silence to say that Jesus got married, unless John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 says so. So we must return to this text for the rest of the discussion. John chapter 2, verse 1, tells us that there is a wedding in Cana, a town near Nazareth, and Jesus' mother is there. This is an odd statement if she was, in fact, the mother of the groom. Then verse 2 says that Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. Again, this is very odd language. If this is a story about Jesus' own wedding, or for that matter, a wedding of any of his brothers or sisters, she goes to Jesus and says, they have no wine. John chapter 2 verse 3. In verse 4, Jesus responds, What is that to you and me? The implication is clear that neither Mary nor Jesus has any obligation when it comes to the catering of the event. But the clincher that this story is not about Jesus' wedding is the last verse, verse 12. Here we are told 
that Jesus went down from Cana to Capernaum after the wedding celebration with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples. Whatever else you say about an early Jewish wedding, one thing is sure. When it's over, the groom definitely doesn't go home with his mom, his siblings, or his students. How far will the secular media go in its attempts to discredit Jesus? Only time will tell. We must be prepared for continual assaults on Jesus and the Bible by a secular world wanting to cast off the moral restraints of Christianity. After the wedding feast in Cana, Jesus with his mothers and brothers and disciples journeyed to Capernaum, approximately 20 miles from Cana. The Gospel narrative indicates that Jesus made Capernaum his headquarters in Galilee after leaving Nazareth. When the Feast of Passover was near, Jesus went to Jerusalem. Scripture records that Jesus participated in three Passover celebrations, with the last one causing his crucifixion. The long history of Judaism has known three temples. The first temple was constructed by King Solomon during the fourth year of his reign. The edifice was built on Mount Moriah to the east of Zion. The construction took seven and one-half years and was completed around 953 BC. The second temple was known as the Temple of Zerubbabel and was erected by the Jews around 520 BC upon their return from Babylonian captivity. According to the Talmud, this temple lacked five things that were in Solomon's temple. It lacked the ark the sacred fire, the Shekinah, the Holy Spirit, and the Urim and Thurim. The Holy of Holies was empty, and on the spot where the ark should have stood, a stone was set up, which the high priest placed the censer on the great day of atonement. History records that this temple was plundered by Antiochus Epiphanes, who defiled it with idolatrous worship. But this temple was partially restored by Judas Maccabeus, Construction on the third temple, that became known as the Temple of Herod, commenced under the auspices of King Herod the Great around 20 BC, with the temple being completed in 64 AD, just six years before its destruction by the Romans in 70 AD. To this temple, Jesus and his disciples came to celebrate the Passover. The Temple of Jerusalem was dedicated as a place of prayer with God. Jesus noticed the perversion of this spiritual mission through the actions of the money changers and the animal merchants in the court of the Gentiles. Jesus was enraged with this perversion, and he made a whip out of cords and drove them out of the temple. And he said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, and make not my father's house a house of merchandise. The disciples recalled that it was written in Psalms chapter 69 verse 9 that the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Malachi also implied that the Messiah would be involved in the cleansing of the temple who would suddenly come to his temple as a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap to purify the sons of Levi that they may offer an offering in righteousness. After the cleansing of the temple, the Jews demanded a sign to establish the authority that authorized Jesus to cleanse the temple. According to the Bible, Jesus always resisted such demands. John chapter 2 verse 19, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews did not understand Christ's reference. They thought that Jesus was referring to the physical temple that took 46 years for King Herod to build. Jesus was making a prophetic reference to his coming death and resurrection. The resurrection would be the final sign of his deity and his authority to be their Messiah. It must be understood 
that before a new temple could be raised up, the old temple must be destroyed. Some historians use the statement that it took Herod 46 years to build the temple to date the ministry of Jesus around 27 AD. But this dating would conflict with the fact that John's ministry began in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. We shouldn't put too much chronological credence into this statement. This event does have its controversy. How many times did Jesus cleanse the temple of the money changer? All four Gospels record this event, but the Synoptic Gospels chronologically place this event during Christ's final week. Why John placed this event during Christ's first Passover? Who is right? When did this event occur? When we harmonize the four Gospels, we can summarize that Jesus cleansed the temple on two different occasions. Simply stated, both are right. Needless to say, the cleansing incident caused considerable turmoil in the Sanhedrin. Jesus provoked interest in some open-minded Pharisees in the Sanhedrin who sent an emissary to Jesus by night with the name of Nicodemus. One question was on their minds. Is this Jesus the Messiah? Nicodemus honored Jesus with the title of Rabbi, a teacher authorized to interpret the law of Moses. He came with an informal question from concerned members of the Sanhedrin. This fact is known by Nicodemus' usage of the word we in John chapter 3 verse 2. These concerned members were troubled by several miracles performed by Jesus, and these events caused them to conclude that Jesus must be a rabbi sent from God. Jesus understanding the heart of the Pharisee scripture interpretation, said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The reference to being born again would be familiar to Nicodemus, since proselytes, when baptized from heathenism into the Jewish faith, were said to be as children newly born. Nicodemus was confused by Jesus' statement since Jews had no need of being born again because they were descendants of Abraham. Jesus, in response to Nicodemus' confusion, stated, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of the water and of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. The idea of being born of the water and the Spirit is a direct reference to the two baptisms introduced by John the Baptist and Jesus. Being born of the water is a direct reference to the water baptism of John, while being born of the Spirit is a direct reference to the baptism of Jesus with the Holy Ghost and fire. John ushered in a baptism for repentance, while Jesus opened a baptism of conversion. Confusion has arisen from this statement. Some Bible teachers interpret the phrase, born of the water, to include a later Christian application introduced by the Apostle Paul that the water is a symbol of the Word of God. This cannot be, since John chided Nicodemus for his failure to understand the symbol. The phrase, born of the water, is a pharisaical concept referring to the baptism of Jewish proselytes. Jesus sought to make it very clear to Nicodemus that human flesh cannot be anything other than human flesh. As a Pharisee, Nicodemus would have trusted in his physical descent from Abraham for entrance into the Messiah's kingdom, not a relationship with God. Jesus chided Nicodemus for not knowing these basic doctrines since he was a rabbi of Israel. 
Why didn't Nicodemus understand the teachings of Jesus? There can be only one possible conclusion. The doctrines of Jesus did not conform to the current theology being taught in the synagogues of Jerusalem. In verse 11, Christ stated that his truth came by revelation from God. But Nicodemus could not receive his witness since it did not conform to Pharisaic doctrine. Jesus rattled Nicodemus even more when he drew a parallel between his ministry and the serpent of Moses being lifted up in the wilderness. John chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus alluded to the fact that he is the prophetic fulfillment of the desert incident with Moses and the brazen serpent. In the same way that Moses lifted up the brazen serpent to heal the children of Israel from the deadly venom of the snakes, so the Son of Man would be lifted up and crucified by the established religious order. All who look to the cross in faith will be saved from the deadly venom of sin and will flow with eternal life. And by this time, Nicodemus was rattled to the core. The truth of God's word seriously challenged the accepted Pharisaic liturgy. It is generally accepted that John chapter 3, verse 16 through 21, is a brief synopsis of Jesus' teaching given to Nicodemus during their night encounter. How much like Nicodemus are we? We sit in our pews with open Bibles, interpreting everything we see and hear through the spiritual glasses of our denominational doctrine. To a Baptist, all that is seen in the Bible is Baptist theology. To a Methodist, they see only Methodist liturgy. To a Pentecostal, they see only the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. To be a dispensationalist or not to be, that is the question. In the end, does it matter? Let us look for common ground where we relate to our brothers and sisters in Christ, not division caused by foolish denominational debate. We see Jesus Christ and the Bible through spiritual glasses that filter the truth of Scripture through our denominational doctrine. Nicodemus had difficulty in understanding Jesus because of the spiritual glasses he had on. What spiritual glasses do you use to interpret the Bible and understand Jesus Christ? Should you desire to understand Jesus Christ in intimate relationship, you must honestly answer this question.